What My Heart Wants. That's our program for today. Hey, welcome to another look into the life and message of Elizabeth Elliot, as she called us to live to a higher standard each day. In this series, we'll continue to hear from Elizabeth's family, friends, and others who are influenced by her life and message. We continue our extended series about Operation Alka and other events during Elizabeth's time in Ecuador. We'll hear about the realized will of God and how God grants our heart's desires. What was the verse that Elizabeth gave when reporters wanted to know about what had happened in Ecuador? Well, we'll hear about that, and also we'll hear from Dr. Tom Howard, one of the brothers of Elizabeth. He'll talk about laughter, books, about accents, and more. That coming up later on this program. Well, let's get to our Gateway to Joy broadcast entitled, The Realized Will of God. Today's programs are both from February of 1989, originally. And there have been some milestones that you are longing for, and then you hit those milestones. Things finally worked out the way you wanted. Why was Jim excited about five different gifts that came within 24 hours, and was he really on his way to Ecuador. You are loved with an everlasting love. That's what the Bible says, and underneath are the everlasting arms. This is your friend Elizabeth Elliot, talking with you this time about the realized will of God. There are times in life when we feel we've arrived. An important event has taken place. We've gone off to college at last. We've passed an exam. We've qualified for this professor's course. We've graduated. Marriage, perhaps. The job that you've dreamed of having. We've reached certain goals. Our dreams are realized. Things are working as we had hoped at last. And if you're as old as I am now, you can look back on many such times, but you can also see that each is only a stage on the journey. This too will pass is good news when things are going badly. It's bad news when things are going as you want them to. The good things will pass too. As Ernest Hemingway said, if two people love each other, it can never have a happy ending. We've been reading from the biography of Jim Elliot, a book called Shadow of the Almighty, and we left off where he was heading for Ecuador. He was packing up to leave, and he was very excited, and he had his passage on a freighter down the West Coast to South America. He had exactly the right amount of money that he needed to pay for that passage, $315 given to him in five different gifts within the space of 24 hours. The realized will is a phrase that occurred again and again in Jim's letters and diaries. And finally, he got to Ecuador. He spent about six months living in Quito, learning Spanish, and then was able to get to the eastern jungle, which was the goal of his lifetime. The desire of his heart was to work in the eastern jungle with the Quichua Indians. And on September 3rd, 1952, he wrote this in his journal. Shandia. As I write, my praise mingles with the steady rush of the Atung Yaku. Those are the Quechua words for the big river, running like pure silver into the jungle under a full moon. Left Shelmeta at three this afternoon in a sky of scattered clouds. Landed at Pano around 3.30 and made the walk to beautiful Shandia in just two and a half hours. The moon rose as I stepped into the clearing with Eladio, the school teacher, and two carriers, prognostically telling me of the faithfulness of God. Surely life is full in his will and brings promise of good things yet for us here. In spite of my wait since Friday, first for the teacher and then for the plane, the thought kept recurring as I came along the trail, right on time, right on time, God's time. So with much joy we have arrived at last at the destination decided on in the will of God when at Wycliffe in 1950 and my joy is full, full, full. Then on October the 27th, he wrote to me, 
This I know, that if next year is as full of sweet surprises and things to be wondered at as has been this last one, and I have no reason now to expect anything less, the situations are analogous in their impossibilities. It will be but stronger evidence of the good hand of God upon and over us, keeping his promises and confirming all we have hoped in him. Is it not for all its sting a wonderful way to live, Betty, to dream and want and pray almost savagely, then to commit and wait and see him quietly pile all dreams aside and replace them with what we could not dream, the realized will? The realized will. Now maybe you're wondering, how was I feeling at the time when Jim was feeling so contented? While I was still in Quito trying to learn Spanish, not sure exactly where I was going to go to start working on a jungle Indian language, pretty sure that I was not going to be with Jim. He hadn't proposed to me. We had been in love for years, but it was still the single life for him. And so, as he says, is it not a wonderful way to live? But he inserted that little phrase for all its sting. There was a sting, all right, probably more for me than for him. I suppose it's always that way. A man means more to a woman than a woman can ever mean to a man. As one of my friends used to say to her husband, I am your wife, but you are my life. And there's a sense in which that's the way God intended it to be, I believe, because the Bible tells us that the woman was made for the man, not the man for the woman. A man always has several things going in his life, and a woman may have her entire life wrapped up in her husband if she has one, or in wishing and longing for a husband if she doesn't have one. I know a lot of women who seem to spend their lives moping and longing for what has not been given. So I have to confess that I was not feeling quite so elated about the whole thing as Jim was. After all, he was where he had always dreamed of being. I was left behind in Quito, the capital city, which was certainly not the jungle. I was still hacking away at Spanish, hoping and praying that someday God was going to bring Jim and me together, and what was I to do in the meantime? But I can look back now and see him quietly pile all dreams aside and replace them with what we could not dream, the realized will. If I had known then the whole story up to the present moment of my life, I would have shrunk from the sight. I would have said, I can't take it. I can't go through that. It's not worth it. I'll collapse. I'll disintegrate. I'll just die. But I can look back now and say, Lord, it was good. It was right. It was in your time. The realized will. And then Jim wrote a couple of months later, and you can see that the routine and perhaps the heat and the irritations of jungle life, the sameness, the familiarity, the monotony, were beginning to get to him so that he wasn't feeling quite so elated as he did when he wrote that first letter. On December 4th, he wrote, Somehow this month, especially with its rush of pressures, I have felt lost without you, Bet. Felt like the world was going by in a whirl of wonder, and I was dazedly letting it go by, in body participating, but somehow the me standing apart looking for something that didn't show in all the wonder and aware that that something was you. It all goes over my head, it seems, and I go through the motions of keeping in the tide. However, if anyone were watching closely, he would know by the quiet sigh in a rowdy game of volleyball, the faraway glance upriver and over the treetops, from mid-current to the clouds away off to the west, and by the sudden creaking in our moonlit room as I roll to the other side of the narrow cot, in an attempt to terminate a longing flight of the imagination. He would know that I was not really all there where I seemed to be. Oh, what an ache wanting you can bring, when I knew that the wanting itself is good, right, even God granted, but realize that now it is wisely God denied, and that he has not let me know all the wisdom of the denial. 
but I believe. And it is this that lets the living go on, the volleyball, the swimming, and the sleeping, and keeps my arms moving and my lips making sounds, while most of me is with you. He wasn't feeling nearly so exuberant at that point. He had a little framed picture of me, which I had given him after my graduation from college. He said, your picture has been a great help. It depicts you, as I like to think of you, longly molded with clear, quiet eyes. It speaks peace to a strong emotion in me, lending an antiquity to my thoughts, an old knowledge, a white-headed patience, as it brings back the dark oak chest of drawers in the dingy apartment in Chester where it stood, or the bird's-eye maple at home, or the nightstand at Savalio's house in Quito, the dozens of times looking up sideways from a suitcase it has surprised me. The picture makes it seem as if it has been forever with us, through everything, the way it is now, and seems to say, Take it easy, Jim, we're not through with the story yet, and you have no basis for believing it will turn out a tragedy. Still, I do, Betty, I do fear sometimes, like a worrying mother, that something will happen to you, and I will lose you. And then what would I do? Where would I be when I wasn't where I seemed to be? Where would my imagination go when I went to sleep? There could be nothing else in life like this for me. Funny, but I never think of my having the accident, and you're losing me. The realized will of God. It's good and acceptable and perfect. That's what Paul said to the Romans. Present your bodies a living sacrifice. Then you will learn as you mature that the will of God is good, acceptable, and perfect. I am one of millions who can testify to the truth of that. Some of you know the end of this love story of Jim and me which we'll come to in the next day or two. And even if you know the end of the story, will you believe me when I say that I wouldn't have had it any other way? The Gateway to Joy 111, The Realized Will of God. Later on, we hear about how God grants our heart's desires. In one of her programs on dating, Elizabeth talked about the five missionaries who were killed More specifically, she talked about a verse that she gave to reporters. And let's look at what John says in 1 John 2, 15. Never give your hearts to this world or to any of the things in it. A man cannot love the Father and love the world at the same time. For the whole world system based as it is on men's primitive desires, their greedy ambitions, and the glamour of all that they think splendid, is not derived from the Father at all, but from the world itself. The world, and all its passionate desires, will one day disappear. But the man who is following God's will is part of the permanent and cannot die. One of my favorite verses, one of the verses that I gave to the reporters who asked us why in the world five men would go into a savage tribe in Ecuador and get themselves killed. And my answer was, the world and all its passionate desires will one day disappear, but the man who is following God's will is part of the permanent. From a series called, Is Dating Necessary? That was Elizabeth Alia talking about the five missionaries. And later we hear from Dr. Tom Howard, one of the brothers of Elizabeth, talking about laughter, books, accents, and more. Right now, though, it's time for our second Gateway to Joy program, How God Grants Our Heart's Desires. Imagine Jim there in the jungle, trying to decide if he should propose to Elizabeth. He wrote to his parents, Were those extravagant boyhood dreams equal to what God had planned for him? Did he really believe that God's will was the best in everything. Did Elizabeth think a proposal was on the way? And what does a banana truck have to do with a marriage proposal? Well, here is Elizabeth, How God Grants Our Heart's Desires. I've been telling you the story of Jim Elliot and his love for me and our long 
waiting for each other. And he's in the jungle of eastern Ecuador, trying to decide whether or not God wants him to propose to this woman who is way over on the other side of the Andes, working in the western jungle. Will it be a help or a hindrance to the jungle missionary work that God has called Jim to? He was beginning to come to the conclusion that it would be a help, far from a hindrance. He wrote to his parents on December 18th, 1952, In my own experience, I have found that the most extravagant dreams of boyhood have not surpassed the great experience of being in the will of God, and I believe that nothing could be better. That is not to say that I do not want other things and other ways of living and other places to see. But in my right mind, I know that my hopes and plans for myself could not be any better than he has arranged and fulfilled them. That's a wonderful testimony, it seems to me, from a 25-year-old man. Most 25-year-olds have a good many dreams that have not been realized. And I don't think, from what you know of Jim Elliot, that you would think of him as a man with no imagination, no real drive, no ambitions. But he was talking about the will of God, and by faith he was accepting the fact that all that he had been given was right and good and perfect and exactly what he needed, and for that he was giving thanks to God. I was working, as I said, in the western jungle, praying that someday Jim Elliot would get God's leading to propose to me, And I thought that it would never happen. The years dragged on. It had been nearly five years since he and I had fallen in love. But finally, in February of 1953, Jim wrote to his parents that he had decided that he was going to marry me. I'll never forget the night that I was sitting in my little thatched roof house in the West Jungle in a little clearing near the Colorado Indians' houses, when I heard the galloping of a horse, which came right into our dooryard and stopped. I ran out, and there was a man with a telegram. The telegram was from Jim. It said, Can you come to Quito? You can be sure that I didn't delay any longer than I had to. I had to wait until the following morning to ride my horse out to the nearest town from which I could get transportation up to Quito. I grabbed a banana truck and rode the ten hours up to the city of Quito, And that evening, in front of a fireplace, Jim asked me to marry him. He wrote to his parents, You will understand this better when I tell you that I gave Betty an engagement ring last night in front of a fireplace. It was a thing settled for me months ago that I should become engaged and only needed the opportunity for us to be together and her to say yes. She did. I wanted to give her the ring for her birthday, the 21st of December, but not wanting to leave Pete alone in Shandia, since Dr. Tidmarsh was here in Quito, I had to wait 40 days and 40 nights to pose the query. Now I'd like to stop right there and ask you women how you would feel if you knew that the man who was dying to ask you to marry him had waited 40 days and 40 nights for the sake of his male colleague there in the jungle instead of coming to you. Well, that was one of those things that I thought of as a typical Jim Elliott decision. He didn't want to leave poor Pete alone, although I dare say poor Pete would have survived somehow without him, and I wasn't sure I was going to survive another day. But I did. I waited the 40 days and 40 nights, not knowing, of course, that Jim had already made up his mind that he was going to propose to me. But finally he asked me, Do you want to marry me? And I had been waiting on God for this moment, waiting for the green light, which would be Jim's proposal. I thought it was a little odd to say, do you want to marry me, instead of just saying, will you marry me, because I think Jim knew that I wanted to. The great question was, was it God's time? In his journal, he wrote, I will marry her in God's time, and it will be the very best for us even if it means waiting years. God has not led us this far to frustrate us or turn us back. Just a few days after we became engaged and announced our engagement publicly, I went for a physical and was told by the doctor 
that I had an active case of tuberculosis. When I told Jim, he said, I don't know what this means. I only know that God is in the generation of the righteous and guides their steps aright. Beyond his counsel and will, there is no going. I am there now, and I want nothing more. I only know that God is in the generation of the righteous. According to your faith, be it unto you. Well, Jim believed that he was going to marry me regardless of whether I had TB or not. I went through a week of further tests. The doctor had told me that this was going to mean having to go back to the States for treatment, but at the end of the week's further tests, the doctor concluded that the original test was a mistake. There was nothing whatever wrong with my lung. So the next step was to move out of the western jungle where I had been working on the language of the Colorado Indians and move into the eastern jungle to fulfill a condition which Jim had appended to his proposal. When he asked me to marry him, he added a strict condition. He said, I want you to learn Quechua first. I've seen enough of missionary wives who come to the field thinking that they're going to be a help for their husbands and plunge hand in hand into the missionary work, but they get bogged down with housekeeping without the usual conveniences that they're used to. They begin having babies, and somehow or other, they just never get around to learning the language. So he said, you're not going to be this missionary's wife unless you learn it first. I had waited a long time for Jim. I thought he was a prize catch. I didn't think there was any price too high to pay to have him for a husband, and so I accepted the proposal with the conditions. And I was very eager to move from the West Jungle over the Andes into the East Jungle. I did that. I hadn't been there very long when I got a shortwave message from Jim telling me that the entire station on which he had just been working had been wiped out by a flood. That flood led to a trip by Ed, Pete, and Jim, the three missionaries who were working with Quechua Indians, trying to find other sites where they might establish mission stations, since it looked as though perhaps God was saying Shandia is not the right place. And while they were on the Bobonasa River looking for such sites, I was living in the tent in Shandia, guarding the things which had been salvaged from the houses that went down the river. When Jim came back from the Bobonasa trip, he said, well, we've found a place where we've got to put a mission station, a little place called Puyupungu. There's nobody to go in and man a station like that except you and me. Guess we better get married. And so we decided on a civil ceremony on October the 8th, 1953. That was Jim's 26th birthday. He wrote to his parents of our intentions on October 3rd. Nobody can accuse us of rushing things just because we have decided to get married in less than three weeks. We have been in love for over five years and I think considered the will of God in marriage as carefully as anyone could. No one really understands our wanting only a civil wedding, but we are going ahead believing that God is our leader and judge of our motives. Our wedding is not the first thing she and I have braved public opinion on. Few have really tried to understand our long waiting for engagement and my going to the jungle single. Few really thought we were the perfect match in the first place. To me, the words and worries of the rest matter not at all. It has been a long lesson learning to live only before God and letting him teach the conscience and to fear nothing save missing his will. But we are learning, and I would live no other way. It had been a long lesson indeed for me from the days of studying Thucydides together in the hall at Wheaton through the months of silence and then correspondence days on Mount Hood and the Oregon coast when I visited in Jim's home, years of uncertainty about the mission field, subsequent guidance and assurance, then Ecuador, climbing Pichincha, one of the high mountains that surround Quito, noon meals at the Ideas home as we learned Spanish, separation to the east and west jungles, Quito again, engagement, separation, a flood, the Bobonasa trip, and then October the 8th, 1953, our wedding day on which the Lord gave us this verse, they shall not be ashamed that wait for me.
God had given us the desire of our hearts. And I thought back to a letter that he had written to me five years before. It does not say he will give you what you want. It does say he will give you the want. Delight in Christ brings desire for Christ. He gives the heart its desires. That is, he works in us the willing, Philippians 2.13, to will and to do of his good pleasure. This is why he can say in John 15.17, Ye shall ask what ye will, if ye abide. The branch takes its sap from the vine. The same surges the vine feels then become the surges of the branch. My will becomes his, and I can ask what I will if I delight myself in him. Only then can my desire be attained when it is his desire. That's the way God grants our heart's desires. If the deepest desire of our hearts is his will, that is the guaranteed root to joy. From 1989, that was How God Grants Our Heart's Desires. In June of 2015, at a memorial service at Gordon College, Dr. Tom Howard, one of the brothers of Elizabeth, talked about laughter, about books, about media, about composure, and more. Here's Tom Howard. My sister Elizabeth, or as the family called her, Betty, was eight years older than I, so that when she was a teenager, I was still a small boy. I point this out simply to emphasize an oddity, namely that she and I had an extraordinary relationship from the start. Somehow, even in the midst of the family hurly-burly, we were six children, which would arise amid the uproarious laughter that often marked the household. Somehow, no matter what was going on, Betty and I could always catch each other's eye in an exchange which said, I know exactly what you are thinking and how you're feeling right now. This touches on something about Betty that her public perhaps never had the chance to see. The thousands of people who became aware of her when her husband, Jim Elliott, was killed in Ecuador, and then, as the years went by, those who were affected by her writings and speeches these people might see her as a sort of heroic, almost Olympian figure. And that is not entirely a wrong impression. She was all of that, certainly. I think our parents were always a bit awed by her, even before she became well known. But she had an extraordinary capacity for laughter. She would laugh loudly and helplessly, for example, over our father's tales of the Pratt Falls that seemed to bedevil his footsteps, and at our oldest brother, Phil, who was an irrepressible mimic, especially of Scottish or Norwegian or Philadelphia accents. She laughed at sheer wit, certain writers like Joyce Grenfell and Cornelia Otis Skinner. She laughed at radio comedians, and she laughed at the general drollery that marked our family life. I should add here that she herself was an irrepressible mimic, regaling us all with her imitations of remarks that she might hear at the grocers or on the street or wherever people gathered. She especially liked regional accents, the local South Jersey twang or the Yankee Argo that we heard every summer in Franconia, New Hampshire. Over the years, she came increasingly to look to me to tell her what to read. While she was still in Ecuador after Jim's death, I'd send her books by Kierkegaard, or Paul Tillich, Dostoevsky, John Updike, Francois Sagan, and so forth. And as time went on, the works of Cardinal Newman and the Russian Orthodox theologians Alexander Schmemann and Kalistas Ware. She also turned more and more to the works of the saints and medieval mystics, of the spiritual writers from the evangelical wing of Protestantism, I would guess that Amy Carmichael would be very near the top of her list. Interestingly enough, she came gradually, and I would say inexorably, to find rest for her soul in the Eucharistic liturgy of the ancient Church. I think that perhaps our Father's manifest love for what he called the great hymns of the Church had instilled in her, as in me, 
and appreciation of the dignity, weight, and majesty of forms of worship that have been hallowed by long usage. In 1956, she became the focus of attention in the media. Life and Time magazines had articles about her and followed her entry with her small daughter, Valerie, into the Alka tribe in 1958. She was, in this connection, flown to New York and found herself swept into that world of news and publishing. She found that world vastly intriguing and, in some sense, sympathetic. <clears throat> the non-religious publishers and photographers found themselves bemused by this woman straight from the jungle and the world of Christian missions, so manifestly civilized and at ease among them. Her aplomb pleased and I think startled them somewhat. She knew how to hold her fork. One of the brothers of Elizabeth, that was Dr. Tom Howard. Well, we're just about out of time once again. But I can at least thank you for letting us come into your home again, the office wherever you happen to be today. On behalf of the Elizabeth Elliott Foundation in cooperation with the Bible Broadcasting Network, thanks for checking out the resources available at elizabethelliot.org. elizabethelliot.org, a lot there for you. And until next time, may God remind you daily that you are loved with what? That's right, with an everlasting love, and underneath are the everlasting arms. Mm-hmm.